we are working with elite of the elite in terms of breathing. And these people are putting it into practice. And if it's good enough for these people, it's good enough for us all. We have an extra special October Bioptimizers offer for you. You get three items, a bottle of Masszymes for better digestion, a book and a cookbook. All you have to do is pay for shipping. Click the link in the description or pinned comment to claim your free gifts. Patrick, welcome to the podcast. How you doing? Good, Jesse. Thanks very much. Good to be here. I'm really looking forward to this. You have so much information on the subject of breathing. And where I want to start is talking about today's modern world. And in your opinion, what would you say are the biggest factors that are negatively impacting our breathing? I think just modern life in general. You know, if you think of how far we are removed from how we used to to conduct ourselves generations ago, um, chronic stress in the workplace, I think, is a big factor. There's a lot of pressure on employees to produce results. There's a lot of pressure on school kids to get results. Academically, there's inflation in terms of what what you need to get into university now is completely different than what you needed 20 years ago. So there seems to be more and more um, pressure and stress on people. And maybe that, that's just my kind of observation, but jobs are involving a lot of talking because many people are on phones and phones can be quite demanding and talking is quite demanding on breathing and also a sedentary lifestyle. Food also plays a role because processed food seems to have some impact on breathing to stimulate respiration. And people typically with a poor diet will often have poor breathing patterns. So, I, you know, there's a number of different factors here that are that are playing in. But can you imagine if we were if we were living even 100 years ago, we would be d- doing physical work most of the day. We would have been eating natural foods. We would have been times of um relaxation and stillness of the mind in comparison to the day, today's society which is very much a go go and when it comes to kids you mentioned kids there how early are we noticing kids that the these breathing patterns are changing for the worse well sleep disorder breathing in young children is a big issue which hardly gets any attention at all Children can have poor breathing from a very, very young age. We're talking about infancy upwards and children with sleep disorder breathing, including snoring. If a child has got sleep disorder breathing and if it's untreated by age five, these children have a 40% increased risk of special education needs by age eight. The problem here with young children is that mouth breathing is a contributory factor to sleep disorders. And if a child has a sleep disorder, it can cause brain damage. So this is not just my opinion. This has been borne out by many studies. One longitudinal study that was conducted over five years in Stratford-upon-Avon in the United Kingdom. And it was conducted by the researcher Karen Barnock. And she looked at 11,000 children. And that was her conclusion. That if children are untreated by age five years of age with sleep disorder breathing, which affects about 15% of the childhood population, these kids have a 40% increase need or risk for special education needs. And, you know, there was a statistic in our paper that was published in the journal Pediatrics. And I think it was 3 million children and teenagers in the United States have issues which result from sleep disorder breathing during childhood. Well, let's take that back even further. Why in childhood are kids having these breathing problems when they're sleeping? Like, how how does that all begin? Nobody knows. You know, nobody really knows. Could it be down to the breathing of the parents? Could it be down to the breathing of the mother? Um, You know, tongue tie is, is overlooked. And if a baby has tongue tie in infancy, they're not able to get their tongue from the floor of the mouth. So they're not able to nurse from the mother so effectively. And breastfeeding is not just about nutrition, but it's also about manipulation of the muscles of the face necessary for craniofacial growth. So, you know, children with poor muscle tone of the face are, face are typically mouth breeders. And if the if the child doesn't breathe through the nose and if the child doesn't have the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth, well, then the face will change. 
and the face will typically be more narrow with a high upper palate infringing the nasal cavity and this is impacting the airway so all we have to do all we have to do is look at crooked teeth you know 100 years ago was it so common that you know what statistics what are the statistics of children now with straight teeth i would say that it's it's not that high like the vast majority of children if you were to look at 10 year olds and 11 year olds and 12 year olds most of them most of those children are going to embark on orthodontic treatment crooked teeth implies that the jaws have not developed correctly now it can be of course influenced by genetics and the environment and there's probably many different factors we're eating soft foods now whereas our ancestors would have been eating hard foods you know so nobody really knows and you know some kids are born with uh, my my own daughter was born with a very high narrow palate and i have a very high narrow palate does the face change in generation to generation and i think it does i think it's you know that the human face is getting smaller and the airway is getting more compromised it's a little bit like there's a dog some form of bulldog and his face is so scrunched up and his airway is so compromised that if you bring him out for a walk on a hot day, it can have a disastrous outcome. You know, because our airway is really the, the key pipe. And of course, breathing is such an important function. And yet this pipe is getting compromised. Look at the number of people with obstructive sleep apnea of all ages, ranging from childhood right through to adulthood, more so in the male population but increases threefold in the female population post-menopause. You know, sleep disorder breathing, it's, uh, it's pretty endemic. So as parents, how do we know if our kids, if their breathing's being affected negatively when they're sleeping? What can we look out for? Is it looking during the day at breathing patterns and assuming that, you know, if they're breathing through the mouth during the day, that's happening at night? Is there certain symptoms we can look for? What do we do to hopefully stop this before it becomes a problem or in the early stages? I think the healthcare professionals really need to um, to do something about this. This has been debated for 100 years. They've overlooked it. I was a mouth-breathing kid. You know, I was born in 1973. And I have to say it absolutely played havoc on my academic achievement. I left school at 14, Jesse, never to return. And that was in 1988, 19, 1989. And I was so frustrated with school because we are demanded to be able to concentrate and to focus and hold our attention. And I, as a mouth breathing kid during the day, nose was stuffed up, having asthma, mouth breathing and snoring during sleep. It wiped out my concentration. And these kids are being labeled as whether they are intelligent or not based on some exam. And nobody is questioning how are these kids breathing. It's a real, it's a joke. That's been honest with you. Now, any parent should look at if their child is mouth breathing during the day, it's a good place to start. And there are simple exercises which will generally help the child to free up their nose. If the child, after doing the exercises, is not breathing comfortably through the nose, well, then you may suspect that enlarged adenoids, which are lymphatic tissue at the back of the nose, is the issue. So no child should snore. And you should never really hear your child breathing during sleep. It's different. You know, an adult who is snoring, I'm not saying that it's, it's, it's okay, but I'm saying it's, it's not as bad as if a child is snoring. Because the room for error with children during sleep is, is minimal. And we shouldn't even hear heavy breathing during sleep. So a child with sleep disorder breathing you know, they can be more likely to be twisting and turning during the night. They're waking up tired. It's very much linked with ADD and ADHD. You know, is it Ritalin that's the solution here? Or is it simply investigating these kids sleep? And also, I think the dental profession has such a place in this because a dentist is such uniquely positioned to be able to identify the risk factors with children. A high narrow palate, jaws that are set back a compromised nasal airway. And it's even going deeper than this because there was a paper published in 2012 by Dr. Christian Guimano, who's considered one of the founding fathers of sleep medicine. He looked at seven young infants who died as a result of sudden infant death syndrome. All of these infants had a compromised airway and this could have been detected early on. 
Now, I can only imagine as a parent that must be the most horrific life circumstance any parent goes through. But yet, this could be identified. And the problem is with this that, you know, very few of us has been, have been talking about breathing in the main. And there are some brilliant doctors who are doing it. And there are some brilliant dentists and orthodontists who are pushing it out there. And there are some amazing people from the United States who are getting it out there. But the professions don't want to know about it. And I don't know what's the answer to that. And I have a feeling that the reason that the professions don't want to know about it is because there's not enough money to be made from it. And maybe I'm sinister by saying that, but, you know, teaching a child how to breed or teaching an adult how to breed correctly, it's not scalable. You can't, you can't make a massive product out of it. You can't, you can't make millions and millions of dollars out of it. And I would hate to think that that's the reason that it's holding it back. But that's where I think after 20 years, because there was resistance to this from the outset. You know, when I was working with people with asthma coming in, many people with asthma, they don't just have asthma, but they are tired all the time. And I was always relating back to my own experience. And if you have asthma, you typically have a stuffy nose. And, you know, it's 10% of the population in the Western world. So you're talking about 8, eight to 10% of the population, which is quite significant. Does it make sense for a person with asthma to be breathing through their mouth? Many of them do because of nasal congestion. And the mouth imparts no function whatsoever in terms of the breath. So even the simple advice of a child or adult going into a doctor's surgery and for the doctor to explain, I'll show you a breathing exercise to decongest your nose, continue breathing through your nose, and it will help your asthma. I'm not saying it's going to cure it. It can have a dramatic impact on your asthma. But it'll take, the exercises do take a little bit of practice. But even just get the advice, breathing in and out through the nose, and also during sleep. You know, if we think of the solution for sleep apnea, a CPAP machine, 50% of people abandon it after about six weeks. So there is a large cohort of the population who are crying out for help. And uh, I wrote an article with two ear, nose and throat doctors published about six months ago in the journal clinical or sorry, it was published in the journal of clinical medicine, looking at breathing reeducation and the phenotypes of sleep apnea. There is a huge role here for breathing reeducation in respiration, in sleep, in mental health. And if you were to add up the numbers of people who are filling those positions, it, it amounts to a large percentage of the population. And Patrick, as somebody who's had asthma and worked through those symptoms, let's get into the specifics of that story because I think it's a really inspiring one because so many people who have asthma probably feel stuck, stuck on the medication, stuck on, you know, just doing what they always do. But you you have a different way. Like I was fortunate. Um, I came across a newspaper article in 1997 and it spoke about the importance of breathing through the nose. And it also spoke about the importance of breathing light. And I suppose it's just one of those things that just kind of struck a note with me because I was doing neither. And I remember doing the nose and blocking exercise and it worked. And I knew straight away there was something about this. And any listener can try it. You know, to, to decongest your nose, all you have to do is hold your breath. You take a normal breath in through your nose, a normal breath out through your nose and pinch your nose and hold your nose. And just to walk around holding your breath and continue walking, holding your breath until you feel, you know, a moderate to strong air hunger and then let go and breathe in through your nose and breathe normally for about a minute and do it again. Repeat it five or six times and you'll feel that your nose will start opening up. Now, that information is not new. That's been around for almost 100 years since 1923, but yet it hasn't got into the public domain. So it's very common, as I said, people with asthma have nasal congestion. And I think people with asthma just don't realize how tired they can be. Because if you have a stuffy nose, you are two to three times more likely to have moderate to severe sleep disorder breathing. And as asthma severity increases, so does obstructive sleep apnea. Medication, of course, has a role. But let's, let's teach these people the basics, you know. Let's teach them the importance of breathing in and out through the nose, both during wakefulness, during rest, during physical exercise, during sleep. Let's teach them how to breathe functionally because asthma is one of those conditions that does change breathing patterns. And when our breathing pattern changes, it feeds into the asthma. So it's a vicious circle. And breathing, I think, Jesse, as well, 
you know, breathing has had a bad rap over the years and it hasn't been taught correctly. You know, too often we hear that take this full big breath and you hear everybody in the studio. All you have to do is go in on YouTube and look at how some of the breathing exercises are explained. That the harder you breathe, the more oxygen you bring into your body and the more carbon dioxide you get rid of. That's dreadful information because carbon dioxide is a catalyst for the release of oxygen from the red blood cells to the tissues and organs. We need carbon dioxide. We can't be getting rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs. This causes our blood vessels to constrict and this causes less oxygen to be delivered throughout the body, including the heart and brain. So people might have tried breathing exercises before. Um, I had up to 1997. Like I'll give you an example. I was at a, when I went back to school, I was very driven and I really wanted to kind of do as, as best I could for myself. Ireland economically was a very poor place. We had, you know, a country which was in, you know, recession for decades. And I made it my goal to get into a university in Dublin called Trinity College. And I got there and I remember going in to do an exam back in probably 95, 96. It was one of my finals. I was a bit anxious going in, but I was typically a faster breeder and an upper chest breeder. And that's the way I breathed all the time. And if you breed like that all the time, you're always teetering on the brink of symptoms. It doesn't take much to push you over the edge. Because if you're already in that sympathetic activation or fight or flight response, all it takes is the minor, the minor situations. Like I see it even with people around me, you know, you see situation presented and you'll see some one person and they're almost ready to explode with the minor issue because that person is in that sympathetic activation. And that's the way I was. Now, I, I didn't never consider that I had anxiety, but I was a bit anxious going into this exam. And I took a walk for about two to three minutes to kind of clear my head before I went into the exam. And I took these full big breaths. I took the full big breaths that you typically hear, you know, people talking about. And I walked into the exam hall and I was totally spaced out, completely lightheaded. And I remember sitting down there and I could not think straight. You know, you have the exam paper in front of you. You've got a limited amount of time. And I was in this state that I was after sabotaging. But of course, I was sabotaging my academic, my ac academic achieve performance anyway, because of my chronic mouth breathing, poor sleep patterns, faster breathing, upper chest breathing, and 25 to 50% of stu ch study children are in this position. No studies on adults, pretty much, but the few do show that 75% of the anxiety population have dysfunctional breathing, 75%. 50% of people with lower back pain have dysfunctional breathing. 30% of the asthma population have dysfunctional breathing, but I would consider it to be more. And in general, it's taught that it's about 9.5% of the normal population, but I would consider it to be higher in around 20%, I think would be a real figure. So, you know, it's not that dysfunctional breathing is affecting everybody, but dysfunctional breathing is certainly affecting different pockets of the population. And when we're talking about functional breathing, then we have to ask, what is that? But that's breathing in and out through the nose. It's driven by the diaphragm. It's breathing a regular breathing rate. It's effortless breathing with a natural pause after exhalation. And the opposite is dysfunctional breathing, mouth breathing, a little bit faster breathing, upper chest breathing, irregular breathing, no natural pause after exhalation, and a feeling of air hunger. Because the person who has dysfunctional breathing patterns, they often feel that they cannot take a satisfying breath. They frequently yawn throughout the day. They sigh frequently throughout the day. And these people, they are in an increased sympathetic state. Their sleep is, their sleep is affected. Their mind is affected. Their physical exercise performance is affected. Their concentration is affected. Their, their quality of life is affected. And, you know, I was writing a new book called Atomic Focus. Because if I was to consider the two most important traits that we need as human beings in today's modern society. One is concentration. And concentration is our ability to hold our attention on one thing. 
and the second is attention span. And that's the length of time that we can hold our attention on one thing. The school child needs it. The university student needs it. The corporate office worker needs it. The military personnel, the police personnel needs it. And sports people need it. Society demands that we can concentrate and hold our attention. But nobody is teaching us how. Education doesn't teach us how to concentrate. But yet to achieve an education we need concentration. Mindfulness does not work for the very group of people who need it the most. Because if you have an individual with lousy sleep, waking up feeling tired in the morning and fatigued, with dysfunctional breathing patterns, they can do all of the mindfulness in the world. It's not going to work. You need to start getting back to basics here. And if I was to look at a hierarchy of needs, deep sleep is the very foundation that we need to achieve. And to achieve deep sleep, we need functional breathing. And functional breathing then goes together. And then we can bring in breath aware, body aware, and mind aware. And then we can achieve flow states. So when we think of leaders and we hear of leaders talking about achieving flow state, this state where the mind is in a state of relaxation and alertness at the same time, that we're in a state of bliss, that we are intuitive, that we are creative, that hours fly by, that we're so immersed in what we are doing that we're not even conscious of it. How do you achieve flow states? Well, I tell you this, people with sleep disorder breathing will not achieve flow states and people with dysfunctional breathing do not achieve flow states. So we have to look at that. Flow states are achievable by a small section of the population. And, you know, this is unfortunate because otherwise we're putting out a goal that's unachievable unless we get the basics right. Well, Patrick, I think it's important before we move forward We've talked about the functional breathing and, and gone over that in a general sense. But for a lot of people, this might be brand new to them, the fact that they should be breathing through their nose versus their mouth. So let's talk about the difference there. What happens when somebody takes in a breath through their mouth versus the nose? Well, what does the mouth do? You know, like what, what does it do? What function is implied by the mouth in terms of the breath? None. The mouth does nothing. It's a hole. That's all. And it's a hole whereby air can go straight down the throat into the lungs. So if you think of the nose itself, the nose performs all of the functions. And I'm not just talking about the everyday functions that people know about, moistening the incoming air and warming the incoming air. But even the gas nitric oxide that's released into the nasal cavity, that's antiviral and antibacterial. You know, COVID times, why not teach people how to nasal breed? Both people who want to reduce the viral load because if you're breathing in and out through your nose, that's your first point of defense. Because the nitric oxide in the nose can help to neutralize germs and bacteria. But also for people who are infected. So say for example a family member. They're sitting in a room and they are infected. and They may not know it, but they feel there's something up with their breathing. And they might feel a little bit breathless if their lungs are affected. And they're breathing there and they're feeling air hunger. They will naturally revert to mouth breathing and they will be breathing faster through the mouth. And mouth breathing is emitting 42% greater moisture loss into the atmosphere. So other family members who are in that room are going to be more like, likely to, to um, inhale those you know, water particles if, if the virus is, is, in, is traveled by you know, airborne particles, water particles. Um, the nose is also when you breathe through your nose, the nose is directly connected. The air that's taken into the nose is directly connected to the brain. So a recent study showed that visual spatial awareness improve when you breathe through your nose, but also your memory and attention improve when you breathe through your nose. So these have been recent studies that have been conducted in 2020. And another aspect would be is in terms of flow states, and this is going back to very understudied, but one paper by Travis and Dolliard in 1996 showed that athletes who nasal breed are more likely to have flow states, to achieve that flow state. Your nose is also linked with the diaphragm breathing muscle. So when you breathe with your nose, you've got better biomechanics. You've got more optimal movement of the diaphragm. And the diaphragm breathing muscle is not just for respiration, but the diaphragm breathing muscle also plays a role in the emotions it massages the internal organs. It helps to re improve venous return to the heart. 
It also plays a very important role in terms of movement because with correct and optimal movement of the diaphragm, it generates sufficient intra-abdominal pressure to provide stabilization for the spine. So the diaphragm breathing muscle is a very important muscle and mouth breathers typically won't engage the diaphragm as effectively as nasal breathers. And sleep apnea, for example, the diaphragm breathing muscle, which is located at the base of the ribs or separates the thorax from the abdomen, that's mechanically linked with the upper airway dilator muscles in the throat. So during wakefulness, we don't have to think of our airway staying open. The throat stays open. But during sleep, many people experience that their throat can collapse during sleep. And if they were breathing in and out through the nose with optimal movement of the diaphragm and breathing light and slow, their throat is stiffer and less likely to collapse. So the other aspect then in, in terms of heart rate variability and stimulating the vagus nerve and I think it was back in 1913 that one researcher found that by stimulating the vagus nerve in a frog, it caused a slowing of the heart. Now we can tap into this and it's all in the exhalation. So for example, if we breathe in fast and if we breathe out fast, it's a stressor to the body and mind. But if we were to breathe in soft or normal breath in and a very relaxed and a slow, gentle exhalation, the relaxed and slow and gentle exhalation out through the nose stimulates the vagus nerve, which secretes the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which causes a slowing of the heart. And when the heart rate slows down, the brain is interpreting that the body is in a safe environment. Any of us can tap into this. There's always going to be situations throughout our day. And any time that you're feeling that stress is getting on top of you, take 90 seconds or a couple of minutes out. Close your mouth, breathe in and out through the nose. Take a soft breath in through your nose, a soft silent breath in through your nose and have a very relaxed and a slow and gentle exhalation. And then a very soft and silent breath coming into your nose and a relaxed and a slow and gentle exhalation. And by doing that, you're telling the brain that the body is safe. And when the brain interprets that the body is safe, the brain will send signals of calm back to the body. So, you know, I remember I put the quotation in, into the, the recent book. It was from a brain surgeon. And he said, the first thing I do is when, when he gets into a tricky situation is to prevent himself from hyperventilating. Because many of us get into tricky situations, but we don't consider our breathing. And our breathing automatically reacts by breathing harder and faster according to the tricky situation. But when we go into that harder and faster breathing, the brain only cares about one thing, and that's to protect the body. Because throughout our evolution, it was our fight or flight response that the brain was there to protect the body. So whenever we as human beings were, were confronted by a dangerous situation, the brain prepared the body for immediate fight or flight. We still, of course, react the same way. But if we are going into that fight or flight mode, we're not going to think straight because straight thinking and logical thinking and reasoning is not necessary when all you want to do is to get the hell out of there. And that's what happens. People are in the workplace. They get into a stressful situation. Their breathing gets faster and harder. Their brain is telling them to get the hell out of there. And they have to sit there and they have to think logically and to try and sort it out, no, instead, tap into your breathing and slow down the exhalation. People won't even know that you were doing it. Bring your attention inwards, even if somebody is giving out to you. Don't surrender all of your attention to the person who's in the bad mood. Bring your attention inwards. Hold your attention on the breath and slow down your breathing. And you know, there's more to this, like Jesse. I was working a few weeks ago with snipers. And they were elite police personnel. So these people are sent into very difficult situations. And they spend an hour at a time behind the sight of a rifle. And you can imagine that there is no room for error here. This, this demands a trained brain. This demands a person to be able to hold attention for that one hour. With no distraction. 
with 100% of undivided attention on that task. And how do you train the brain? But you can train the brain by improving the physiology, not just enough to focus on the breathing, but improve the biochemistry, improve the biomechanics, and bring in resonance frequency breathing. But we went one step further, because part of the, the assignment was how to breathe while pulling a trigger. So I was considering it and I reached out to some of our SWAT instructors, their special weapons and tactics personnel in the United States. And I reached out and I says, I said, what do you normally do? And they said, well, you can do it this way and this way and this way. And okay, there was a number of different variations. You could breathe in and hold your breath and pull the trigger, as some people do. You could breathe out and hold your breath and pull the trigger. You could pull the trigger as you're inhaling or you could pull the trigger as you're exhaling. Now, I had never pulled the trigger of a gun, but a little bit I do know was about breathing. And I said, well, what's the best way here? And I just thought about it and I said, okay, during the inhalation, the inhalation is more driven sympathetically. So the vagus nerve is stepping back. And during the exhalation, it's primarily under the control of the body's relaxation response. So I said, it's not in the inhalation. And as you inhale and you go into the exhalation, you pull the trigger just towards the bottom of the exhalation because that's when the vagus nerve is stimulating or secreting acetylcholine and you breathe into the shot. And that's what we did. And it worked. And I'm not saying that it's going to work for everybody, but I would say to people is it just gives you an example of what you can do with the breath that you can change your states. And Many people here, you know, they, were going, they are going to be like me. They're going to have history of sleep disorder breathing, including sleep apnea. They're going to have a history of poor concentration and totally stuck in their heads all the time. And it's really important if you want to achieve your full potential and if you want to achieve a happiness and to be creative and to be intuitive and to be, you know, to really reach to the best of your ability. And I think as human beings, we need a purpose and we need to be able to contribute. You know, I think it's important. We can do that. But a great tool is optimal breathing. And again, it's not the nonsense that's normally being taught. And the reason I say that is because it has done a disservice to breathing. It has done a dreadful disservice. We have to get breathing out of the realm of left of field and tree huggers and open sandal brigade and we have to bring it to the everyday people because the everyday people need this. But with the reputation that breathing has had for decades, people are, you know, they're often put off by it. And that's why I always use the example that we are working with elite of the elite in terms of breathing. And these people are putting it into practice. And if it's good enough for these people, it's good enough for us all. So say the everyday person right now is listening to this and say they've been unconscious of the way they're breathing for a number of years. We could use any example. In their 30s, and their 40s, they form these patterns of destructive breathing. What's the best way for them to start to breathe through their nose? Is being you know mindful of it enough? Like that can work in the moment, but then, you know, the kids crying in the other room and, and you got to run and do this. Like how do we begin to form that into a habit that is that we don't have to think about and just apply it to our day to day? Well, I suppose a habit comes just through practice. You know, if you practice something continuously, if you're aware of it and you keep bringing your attention onto the breath, ultimately it becomes part of you. You could measure your breath whole time, your bolt score. And that will give you some indicator of your functional breathing patterns. And to measure your bolt score, you need a timer. Sit down for about five, five minutes or so. Take a normal breath in through your nose and a normal breath out through your nose and pinch your nose with your fingers. And you time it in seconds until you feel the first definite desire to breathe. Or the first involuntary movement of your breathing muscles. And your breathing at the end should be fairly normal. If your bowl score is greater than 25 seconds, there is an 89% chance that dysfunctional breathing is not present. But if you have a bowl score of 10 seconds, 
or 15 seconds or 16 or 17 seconds, it's likely that this functional breathing is present. Your breathing is a little bit faster and harder. You might feel that you're not getting enough air. You might feel disproportionately breathless. You might experience insomnia because if you're breathing fast during the day, you're going to breathe fast during sleep. And if you breathe fast during sleep, you often get aroused from sleep. So you will wake up. So you might experience insomnia during the night or snoring or sleep apnea. So I think always when I'm working with people, I kind of show that, yeah, you know, if you breathe this way, it's going to impact you this way, this way, and this way. And that's why it's worth changing. And the one thing about the breath is that when you do change it, all you have to do is give it a little bit of attention. Now, I will say this as human beings in the modern society, what are we often doing but completely stuck in our head, oblivious to what's going on around us? We're not even present anyway. We're drowning in thought. We've been trained how to think, but we haven't been trained how to stop thinking. And taking your attention out of the mind and onto the breath and bringing your attention into the body. It's a great sense of calmness and quietness of the mind. And you are training the brain to hold attention. I think it's one of the best tools that we can do. Now, is it enough just to pay attention to the breath? No. But most definitely, I would start with breathing in and out through the nose. And even when you do your physical exercise, bear in mind that the mouth does absolutely nothing. Your mouth is an emergency, um, you know, response. It's not, it's not for breathing. Do your physical exercise with the mouth closed. And if the air hunger is too much, just slow down a little bit, but maintain nose breathing. Now, I would practice this though. When you're at home in the evening and you're winding down and maybe just before sleep, put one hand on your chest and one hand on your tummy. Bring your attention onto the breath. And really slow down the speed of the inhalation. Breathe almost imperceptibly in through your nose. Breathe so softly in through your nose that the fine hairs within the nostrils do not move. And at the top of the breath, bring a total feeling of relaxation to the body. That you're having a relaxed and a slow and a gentle breath out. You're taking a really soft breath in through your nose. And you're taking a really relaxed and a slow and gentle exhalation. And during that practice, breathe less air. Breathe less air to the point of air hunger. You should feel that you're not getting enough air. You should feel that you would like to take in a deeper breath. And that signifies that carbon dioxide is increased in the blood. And as carbon dioxide increases in the blood, it helps to improve your blood circulation. It helps to improve oxygen delivery throughout the body. But it also stimulates the vagus nerve. So for 10 or 15 minutes before sleep, Really slow down your breathing to the point of under breathing. Breathe less air into your body and take about 30% less air into your body and feel the air hunger. You will feel drowsy. The increased watery saliva in the mouth is an indicator that you're going into rest and digest mode. There's increased watery saliva in the mouth because the body is preparing for food intake. Because when we get stressed, our mouth goes dry. Eating is the last thing that we need to do when we're stressed. So it's a very good way to downregulate is to bring your attention onto the breath and breathe less air. And just check, does it improve your blood circulation? Do you notice that your hands are getting warmer? Because it's very common for people with poor breathing patterns to have cold hands and cold feet. Do you find that it's helping you to wind down? Are you feeling drowsy? which is conducive to having that deeper sleep. And it's a great tool for the last 15 minutes. Now, we do other stuff as well, you know. Like, I'll give you one example. One exercise that we do with elite athletes, which I'm going to go to the other extreme, stressing. We mark out 40 meters of a distance using bollards. And we have the athletes breathe in through their nose and out through their nose and pinch their nose. And they sprint holding their breath for 40 meters. And when they get to the bollards, they have a 30 second recovery before they sprint back again for 40 meters. And a 30 second recovery before they sprint again for 40 meters with their breath held. So no air. We do five reps. Now that will drop blood oxygen saturation, it will increase carbon dioxide, it will add an extra load onto the breathing muscles, 
that's a stressor. And we use that to reduce the onset of lactic acid and fatigue, to improve the buffering capacity, to open up the airways, to improve respiratory muscle strength, but also to train the brain that we can push the body a little bit harder, that we can cope with hypoxia, intermittent hypoxia, that blood oxygen saturation is dropping. We can cope with hypercapnia. So, you know, there's different things that you can do with the breath. We can downregulate before sleep. We can improve functional breathing for different conditions, including asthma, sleep disorder breathing, high blood pressure, low blood pressure. Um, so, for example, high blood pressure and low blood pressure. There are baroreceptors, which are pressure receptors in the major blood vessels. And their role is to monitor changes in blood pressure. And if there is an increase in our blood pressure, the baroreceptors should be so sensitive to pick up on that increase to blood pressure and send immediate signals via the brain for the blood vessels to open and for the heart rate to slow down to normalize blood pressure. And conversely, if there's a fall in our blood pressure, the baroreceptors should be so sensitive and pick up on this and send immediate message that the brain to the blood vessels for the blood vessels to constrict and the heart rate to increase to normalize blood pressure. We can improve the sensitivity of the baroreflex through breathing, which in turn improves heart rate variability. And heart rate variability is a measure of vagal tone. The body is in a state of balance. We can go from stress into relaxation. So, you know, through the breath, we can change quite a few things and we can influence the autonomic nervous system, which is normally outside of our control but by changing our breathing patterns. And all it is, is having the knowledge of how do we change breathing patterns? You know, for a person coming in with a panic attack, a person who's prone to panic disorder, how to work with that person, a person with depression, a person with chronic fatigue, how to work with that person, a person with severe asthma versus a person with mild asthma, how to work with that person, a person who is a sports champion, how to work with them, how to work with a four-year-old kid, you know, we can do it through the breath, but it does take a bit of experience. And I've made plenty of mistakes over the years. I've put people into panic attacks. I've had people coming in with chronic fatigue syndrome and I pushed them too hard with the exercises. I would completely floor them and they wouldn't come back to me. You know, and you learn these things. And you, it's not that you do it intentionally, but you always tweak it. And it's like a builder. We have builders now. We're building a clinic. And I like to see a builder coming in that's about 40 or 50 years of age because he typically will know his stuff. And the builder who's coming in 20 years of age, they'll often, they'll give me a price that's off the wall. And two, number two is they don't have the experience. But the 50-year-old typically does, especially if the 50-year-old has been doing something for 30 years. And I'm not just saying, you know, I'm really talking about somebody who wants to keep adjusting, to keep improving, because ultimately that's what it's about. For the average healthy adult, you mentioned that exercise where they're going to be starving themselves of breath a little bit before bed, doing that for about 15 minutes. And then we talked about while somebody's exercising, say they're jogging or working out, they should be keeping their mouth closed, breathing through their nose, and also being mindful throughout the day, just as they're doing their day-to-day -day activities to breathe through their nose. Is that enough to, you know, maintain a healthy state when it comes to breathing, doing those three things? Yeah, it's a, it's a big factor. Um, now, if somebody comes in and they're pretty unwell, we would ask them to do about 40 to 60 minutes throughout the day. Like you think of somebody maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, a gardener. And I often use this example. You can imagine a gardener who is doing a lot of manual work throughout the day. They're moving around, they're out in the fresh air. They're probably growing their own food, so they're going to be eating well. They're, they're moving their muscles. And in doing so, they're producing more carbon dioxide. All that person has to do is breathe in and out through their nose. Because as they move their muscles, they're increasing their metabolism. They're generating more carbon dioxide. And nasal breathing, because of the resistance it imposes to breathing during the day, will increase carbon dioxide in the blood. And by doing so, will reduce the body's response or ventilatory response to carbon dioxide. 
So that person who is a gardener, if they just switch to nose breathing during all of their physical exercise, they would have to do nothing else. They wouldn't need any breathing practice. And that's the way we were doing it anyway, you know. But maybe a gardener today is out there now with his mouth open. So they're using a spade and the mouth is open and they're breathing in and out through the mouth and they're engaging the upper chest and breathing that bit faster. Well, that's not going to work. So, you know, anybody who's doing any decent amount of physical exercise, going for walks, going for jogs, doing whatever you're doing, maintain nasal breathing and that's a great start. And then doing those those three different modifications and breathing through the nose, is that going to be enough? You mentioned the bolt score earlier. If somebody is a bit lower in that score and they want to bring it up, or even if they are at 25 or greater and they want to even bring it up to an exceptional level, is are those activities going to impact that? Well, it depends on how long they're doing it for. You know, are they doing a half an hour to an hour of physical exercise a day? That would do it if they change their, their breathing during physical exercise. Do they have their mouth open, though, during sleep? So none of us should wake up with a dry mouth in the morning. And if you wake up with a dry mouth in the morning, you're more likely to experience sleep disorder breathing, including snoring, insomnia, obstructive sleep apnea. So we use taping of the mouth, and I've been taping my own mouth since 1997. It's guaranteed a really good night's sleep. You know, it's tremendous. So I suppose it's looking at breathing 24-7. Now, sometimes, you know, if you're talking, you're going to take the odd breath through the mouth. And again, that I wouldn't find issue with. What I'd be looking at is looking at the bigger picture. Do you have your mouth closed during sleep? Do you have your mouth closed during the day? Are you able to cope with stressful situations? Now, you develop this resilience anyway, and you can build it up through your breath that you're not reacting to it. So you can cope much better with it. And I would also say that if you've got good sleep quality, you're going to cope better with it as well. But of course, it can be influenced genetically. But even aside from that, you can still train it. Because if a person is not able to cope well with stress, that can hold back their breathing. If a person is talking for six or seven or eight hours a day, that can hold back their breathing because talking is demanding to the breath. You know, people who are, if they're in sales all day or if they're teaching or working with clients all day, um, their breathing is going to be faster and harder, especially if they have to project their voice. And that is going to contribute to hyperventilation. And if you talk to people who are working in occupations that involve a lot of talking, ask them, how tired do they feel towards the end of the day? And they will tell you that they can be absolutely exhausted. And they may put it down to, you know, it's because they have to focus on what they're talking about. It's not. I don't have to think about what I'm going to say. You know, we don't have to prepare. If you're doing something for a few years, it comes second nature to you. But the issue is that you're talking and excessive talking is impacting your breathing. And that's what's causing your fatigue. You mentioned there that you've been taping your mouth when you sleep since 1997, so quite a long time. I also do this. I'm a big fan of it. Is this something for everybody, would you say? And if this is a totally new concept to people, because I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that haven't heard of this, that might seem pretty extreme. Let's talk about what that looks like. It's only for people who wake up with a dry mouth, you know. So if you wake up with a dry mouth in the morning, it's, it's an indicator that you have your mouth open during sleep. And what, what's the option? One is to continue mouth breathing during sleep and experience possibly sleep issues. Or the other is to breathe through your nose, wake up with a moist mouth in the morning, and it protects your dental health as well because mouth breathers are more prone to gum disease, dental cavity, bad breath. So I was wearing tape, 3M one-inch micropore tape for many years. And but we always had an issue of how can we help to train children and teenagers. So a couple of years ago, I brought out a tape called Myo Tape. And like I can show it to you if you like. Sure, yeah. It's a different concept because it's a tape that doesn't cover the lips. And, you know, we actually brought it out for children. We used to, kids would come into the classes. And the first thing that I do when the kids come into the class with their parents is I ask the parents, can the child wear a piece of tape across their lips? And we do all of the exercises with the child taped up. 
And the reason being is because I want to see, can a child breathe functionally? Do they have the airway to be able to breathe through their nose during, during the class? And then we always say to the parents, when the child goes home, especially when the child is distracted, to wear myotape around the mouth, to bring the lips together, because we want to start changing that habit. And typically it takes about 60 to 70 days. And when a child or teenager then is able to breathe functionally through the nose during the day, then we ask the parents to consider it during sleep. Now the tape is a, it's an elasticated cotton tape. And it's shaped and you see this is the orange one here. So the, the color now has changed. So this is the older one. The color has changed to kind of a skin color because people didn't, people didn't think it was so attractive with wearing orange tapes around the, so with this tape here, we stretch it. So I'm going to give it a fairly good, now this is the adult's version. Stretch. Okay. So the tape now is, it's pulling in a bidirectional relationship. So it's pulling my, my, my lips together and I'm pouting. And I also spoke with physical therapists in terms of stimulating the orbicular source muscle, which is the muscle surrounding the mouth. And it helps to stimulate and activate that. And we have children wearing this while they're distracted. So if they're watching television, because a child will want to talk. And if you're just to tape their lips and the child, then whenever they talk, they pull off the tape and you, it, it loses. It. But with a tape like this, it allows the child to take a drink if they need to take a drink, talk if they need to talk. But every time that the child forgets about breathing through the nose, when they open their mouth, the tape automatically reminds them because they feel the tension. So they feel the tape pulling their lips together again to get them breathing through the nose. And it was a game changer for us because, you know, for many years, I was focusing so much on getting the nose open and not enough on changing the behavior. And really, it is about changing the behavior. And I suppose it draws back to my own experience. Like the myotape we use for sleep as well for adults. Now it's cheap, Jesse. It's $25 for three months. So it's $7 a month. And that's including international postage. So, you know, I think it's worth it for a good night's sleep. But I had an operation on my nose in 1994 because of chronic nasal obstruction, years of having nasal obstruction. But nobody told me to breathe through it afterwards. And I just feel that it's something that has been overlooked as well by most ear, nose and throat doctors. Now some understand it and some get it. And I spoke to ear, nose and throat doctors in 2019 at a European Congress and I had 150 ENTs in the room and I said to some doctors, I said, there's no question that your surgery works. It works to open up the nose. But the real question here is, if people have been mouth breathing for six months or more, they have developed a habit of mouth breathing and even if they have a free nose, they may not use it because the mouth breathing habit continues. Now, this applies not just to adults, but also to children. That children who undergo tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, there is a 65% relapse within three years unless nasal breathing is restored. And again, I suppose, you know, it's not enough to fix the nose, but we have to change the behavior. And that's with breathing. And the other thing, the point that I like to make when it's in my head is that I want to focus on not just how is a person breathing inside the studio with me, but more importantly is how are they breathing outside of the studio? How are they breathing during sleep? <clears throat> how are they breathing when they go for a walk? And if I was to say one thing, the modality which has the biggest potential to change lives in terms of breathing is yoga. And all a yoga instructor has to do is understand breathing from a number of different dimensions. When they are guiding their students through all of the different poses to bring in all of these breathing practices, don't just focus on breathing big or breathing deep or breathing heavy. You know, bring in the biochemistry, bring in the biomechanics, bring in resonance frequency breathing. But also towards the end of the class, have the student bring functional breathing off the mat, bring it home with them. Because I can imagine if I was a youngster, a 16 or 17 year old going to sports 
and if the coach was there, and if the coach was equipped and telling me to breathe through my nose, it would have changed my life. Many people are going into yoga. Millions and millions of people are doing yoga. They're getting a lot of worth out of it. But it has the potential to transform lives in terms of the breath. And original yoga breathing was not about breathing hard. Original yoga breathing was about conservation of the breath. Conservation of the breath is when you feel air hunger. Air hunger is very much part of what we do. And there's something about this from a psychological point of view as well, because air hunger can be uncomfortable. So when I have somebody practice breathing less air and they're feeling that air hunger and they're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, I don't want to feel I don't want them to feel stressed. But if they're feeling uncomfortable, I'm asking them to relax and to surrender to the discomfort. Don't react to the feeling of discomfort. And this way you are training the brain to be able to improve stress handling ability. Because we do come across uncomfortable situations throughout our life. And we can use the breath to train the brain to better cope with that. Patrick, up until this point, we've been emphasizing the importance of breathing gently, breathing slow, breathing through the nose. There's also a whole erupting wing of breathing in the health and wellness space the Wim Hof type breathing, where people are trying to take in as much air as possible, as quickly as possible, breathe that out. In your opinion, does that have a place? And if so, where? Yeah, it's a stressor. So just as we do long breath holds, we do also hyperventilation too, with a few of our exercises now in the new, the newer book, The Breathing Cure. Um, but I think it's important to make a few points. Number one is, if a person has dysfunctional breathing, they are going to react to hyperventilation stronger than a person with functional breathing. And I would be as like, I've made too many mistakes with the breath. If I had somebody coming in here with panic disorder, I would not teach them hyperventilation. We have this tool as well, but I wouldn't teach it to them. And nor would I teach it to somebody with asthma. So there are some people that I definitely would not teach it. I think it's important to realize that with the breath, it can be very powerful and we can do harm if we just have it with one approach fits all. Now, the other thing is, is it good to stress the body and mind without bringing in recovery? Many people are hyperventilating for 30 breaths. They breathe out and hold. Their blood oxygen saturation is dropping, maybe in the first cycle down into the 80s. They breathe in and hold their breath for 10 seconds. They hyperventilate then for 30 breaths and they do a second breath hold. Their blood oxygen saturation goes down into the 70s. Severe hypoxia. Then they breathe in and hold for 10 seconds. Hyperventilate again for 30 breaths and do the third cycle of a breath hold. Their blood oxygen saturation drops down to maybe 50%, even 60%, 60% maybe 50%. That's a pretty big stress. You know, to lower your blood oxygen saturation to 50 or 60%. Have we ever do, done that throughout our evolution? Has there been a time that we as human beings have pushed ourselves to that extreme? If I asked, you know, somebody, an elite athlete to hold their breath without hyperventilation, they wouldn't drop their blood oxygen saturation down into the 50s. This is something that you achieve if you're at the top of Mount Everest. So... I just feel that, you know, there is absolutely a role for stressing the body. We've been using breath holding for 20 years. We've stressed, we put the body into severe hypoxia, hypercapnia, and this causes adaptations which are beneficial. But there's a point at which we have to tailor stress to suit the individual. And there's a point at which a good stress can become a bad stress. And if you stress the person, you must teach them how to recover. So... If I was to tweak it in terms of what we do in hyperventilation, we typically have 20 full big breaths in and out through the nose. So 20 full big breaths. So we do with the hyperventilation. Then we do an exhale hold as normal until a moderate to strong air hunger. It's going beyond the diaphragmatic contractions. But then we do breathe like for three minutes. So we can cause, during the hyperventilation, we cause hypocapnia and hyperoxia. During the breath hold, we will cause hypoxia. 
and carbon dioxide may or may not return back upwards. But during the breathe light exercise, we bring everything back into balance again. And then you can do hyperventilation. So I think it's just important to understand that, yes, you know, if you're doing physical exercise and if you're sprinting, you're not going to just get off the couch and do a sprint. You're going to warm up first. So we do breathing exercises to warm up. Then, and we also do, say, say, say for example, we start off with breathing recovery exercise, what we start off with typically. And we do that sitting. And then we do the breathe light exercise, a few different variations from a biochemical point of view, biomechanical point of view. And then we do a breath hold walking for between 10 and 15 paces. And then we do a breath hold running. And then we go back down to walking with the mouth closed with functional breathing. So I think it's very important to show people how to breathe if they could do physical exercise. You know, it's okay teaching somebody how to breathe while they're sitting down. But how should you breathe optimally to improve oxygen uptake when you go for a jog? Is there a way to improve the gas exchange? And what would you expect when you start doing your physical exercise with the mouth closed? And if you have nar narrow nostrils versus large nostrils or, you know, different things to take into consideration. So, yeah, I think with the breath, we, we also, so we have the person then do different cycles of the breathing, but we'll always warm up. And we also warm down. And that's important as well. So like the Wim Hof method is excellent. But I think people for to understand that how are you breathing outside of it? How are you breathing when you're asleep? How are you breathing during physical exercise? Are you going easy at the start and warming your body and preparing your body for the hyperventilation of breath holes? And do you realize what's happening when you're doing hyperventilation? Is it true that oxygen is roaming freely throughout the body? Is it true that you're increasing oxygen delivery to tissues and organs, including the heart and brain? Or is it true that as you're hyperventilating, you're getting rid of so much carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs? And as a result, you have a left shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Less oxygen is being delivered throughout the body. Your blood vessels are constricting. The body is going into a stress mode. And then you breathe out and you hold your breath and you're lowering your blood oxygen saturation into severe hypoxia, which is going to improve buffering capacity, which is going to stimulate the kidneys and the liver to a lesser extent to synthesize the hormone erythropoietin, which is going to cause maturation of blood, blood, it's going to cause a maturation of blood cells from the bone marrow. But also as you do a long breath hold, your spleen is contracting, which is releasing red blood cells into circulation. So, the long breath hold is causing adaptations, no question. And they can be very positive adaptations. And then after doing your long breath hold, breathe in for 10 seconds, hold your breath. And then breathe light for three minutes. Bring your body into that state of relaxation. So you're pushing the sympathetic response and the, then the parasympathetic response. Sympathetic, parasympathetic. You're shaking the autonomic nervous system. It's good to have both create the balance. That makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And one thing I've found very helpful is to hyperventilate and then doing breath holds before an interview like this to get thinking more sharply, being more focused. I've just found that and I've done guided breath work to to get to that place. And now I've done that enough times that I kind of just do my own thing. But what are your thoughts on that? Say you, Patrick, you're going to go and do a presentation or a podcast interview what kind of breathing work will you do beforehand to be your best? Number one is I'm an introvert. So I talk for a living. Um, and before COVID, I would spend six months on the road giving presentations. Um, I never turn up in an event until the last moment, or at least maybe a half an hour, an hour at the very, you know, furthest away from it. So say if, if an event is on at two o'clock, I'll turn up to the hotel room, the conference room at one o'clock that day. And I won't talk to anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody because I want to conserve as much energy as I can for the event. And if you are giving a public talk, make sure that you do conserve your energy. If people are coming over to you, talking to you, walk away, just say to them, you just, you know, you have to do your own thing. I sit down 
And what I will do is I'll close my eyes and I will bring my attention inwards and I will completely slow down my breathing for about 15, 20 minutes. And I've even done it for more than half an hour to 40 minutes. And I'm conserving energy, conserving it, conserving it, conserving it, bringing my attention into the present moment, back onto the breath and bringing my body and mind into a state of relaxation. Now, after that, I'll do three easy, two or three easy breath holds because I don't want to go out too relaxed. And then I will do five strong breath holds. And then just before I go out on stage, I literally flood my body with a feeling of energy. And it's not, I hope I'm not talking, sounding too new agey, but literally I just get a sense of energy throughout the body. And I'll walk out on stage with every cell in my body. I want to walk out not just being ahead. And I walk out with my attention dispersed throughout the body. And I will give my talk with my attention dispersed throughout the body. And most of the time, I'm not going to use notes. I don't like PowerPoints. I absolutely d detest them. I, well, to be honest with you, I'm probably too lazy to prepare them anyway. You know, yesterday I was giving a talk for two hours um, to dentists in, in California, and I had no PowerPoint pre presentation prepared, and I was doing it live online. But, you know, I spoke for two hours, and I used my pen, and it worked because I didn't have the time to do a, a presentation for them for two hours. So I spoke off the cuff and I guided them through the exercise. And I think it's good because I think the PowerPoint is up there and people are hypnotized by the PowerPoint. And, um, you know, what do you want people to have their attention on? Up on the PowerPoint, not listening to what you're saying? Or no PowerPoint? And the only thing then that they can have their attention on is you. And I also feel as a speaker or as a talker, the more you can bring your own attention into the, I know people say the present moment, but literally it is, you know, you, you don't want to be immersed in thought. You don't want to be in the past. You want to be absolutely focused on doing what you're doing. And by doing that, you can bring the listener into the same. So I think it's a great way. I think it's, it's a tremendous way in public speaking. Of course, it gets easier with, with practice. It's one of those things, you know, so people starting off, so I'd say is use breathing, though. It is a very, very good tool and get a higher bolt score, because if you have a low bolt score, you're you're going to be on the brink of symptoms pretty quickly. And there was a study that was conducted with university students going into concert musicians. And they monitored their breathing prior to a concert. And prior to the concert, the students breathing started to become irregular. But the students with the most anxiety had the most irregular breathing. Now, this comes back to the brain surgeon that when he gets into a tricky situation, the first thing he does is he prevents himself from hyperventilating. How many people going out on stage, giving a public performance and even a live television performance had a panic attack? And they had a panic attack because the stress was causing their breathing to be faster and harder. Too much carbon dioxide was removed from the blood through the lungs. Blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain was reduced. And they set off in motion a panic attack. So could there be a way to deal with that? Yes. Use breathing as your preparation. And speak to nobody before the event. Conserve all of your attention. And if you're an introvert, it'll say good for you. But the problem is that most leadership positions are filled by extroverts by people who command attention, the loud mouth in the room, the person who's able to walk the room and shake hands with everybody. Most leaders are that person. And that's, that's, the stats are showing that. I think the statistic is 76%. But 76% of the population aren't extroverts. I'm not sure what the population are introverts. People who are inward thinking, people who like solitude, People who get drained of energy if they're talking too much. That's me too. So, but then again, what are the positive things about introverts? Creativity. Intuition. We can work of our own accord. We also like one-to-one -one conversations as opposed to being the center of attention. I think there's a really good role for introverts. We are less risk takers. So, for example, the financial crisis in 2008 and the banking sector, the people who were heading the top positions 
risk takers, male driven egos with plenty fueled with testosterone, extroverts, and big risk takers. And look at the suffering that they caused. If there were a few introverts thrown in there, and if there were introverts on those board of directors, and bringing a balance and thinking things through, it would have been a different position. So it's time that society starts recognizing the role of introverts as well, that introverts can have something very positive. And I remember as a kid growing up, I would often feel that, you know, you would you would feel that you're not quite as confident or you're not as capable as the extrovert because the extrovert had the full confidence going in. But all I say is life is a long journey and uh if you're an introvert, you'll be pretty glad that you are. Just give it some time. I want to talk more about exercise and breathing. I've been a runner for a number of years. And to be honest, I've never really concerned myself with how the air was getting in. I've probably been doing a combo of nose breathing and mouth breathing. But after reading your book, chatting with you today, I'm excited to get back out there and, and focus on breathing through the nose. What would you recommend for somebody like me who's a recreational athlete? Say it's, you know, biking, running. I guess swimming's a bit different because you have the water there and you're it's going to change the way you go about breathing. But what would be the best way to start incorporating this? And what kind of changes should I expect to notice, at least in the beginning? It depends on a couple of things. One is it depends on your nostril size. If you have a nostril nose like mine that's completely messed up and screwed up, you're going to be compromised. So use a nasal dilator. That will allow you to breathe more comfortably through the nose. A nasal dilator is based on the cotton maneuver. If you just put one finger either side of your nose and just gently prise your nostrils, does it feel easier to breathe? And if it feels easier to breathe, then it can be useful getting that device. From here, you don't seem as compromised as I am, Jesse. So it's quite, you know, likely that you're able to sustain nasal breathing easy during physical exercise. The second thing is bolt score. The higher the bolt score, the less breathlessness during physical exercise. So the higher the bolt score, the easier it is to sustain nasal breathing. Another aspect is that when you first switch from mouth to nose breathing, only go at a pace that you can sustain nose breathing. Think of what the nose is doing during that time. The nose is protecting the airways. The nose is increasing oxygen uptake in the blood. The nose is increasing carbon dioxide to allow more oxygen to be delivered to the working muscles. The nose is targeting a greater amplitude of the diaphragm for more functional movement and less risk of injury. So breathing through the nose is imparting so many benefits. It just doesn't make sense to breathe through the mouth. Mouth breathing is fast and shallow breathing. It's it's reducing oxygen uptake. The fraction of the fraction of expired oxygen is less with nasal breathing. Recovery is much better with nose breathing post physical exercise. Now, of course, initially when you switch from mouth to nose breathing, the air hunger that you experience is stronger. And the air hunger is stronger because of the increased carbon dioxide in the blood, because the nose is, it imposes a resistance to breathing that's more than that of the mouth. And by doing this, sorry, there are some interruptions now, but by doing this, um, I've got three dogs and of course they're all after coming in together. So as it happens, but when you switch from mouth to nose breathing and you're feeling that air hunger, bear in mind that the air hunger is telling you that carbon dioxide is increased in the blood. But what is the increased carbon dioxide doing as it's in the blood? It's improving your blood circulation and it's increasing oxygen delivery to the working muscles. So even though you feel air hunger during physical exercise, the oxygen delivery is better. So now... The other thing is that the more you do your physical exercise with the mouth closed, your body adopts to the higher carbon dioxide in the blood. So earlier on, when you asked the question, you know, if you were doing your physical exercise with the mouth closed, would you need to do anything else? Probably not. Because if you were doing physical exercise with your mouth closed and having your mouth closed for the rest of the day, your physical exercise with the mouth closed is a great way to reduce the response of the body to the buildup of carbon dioxide. Now, the only thing I would say is that if people have a bolt score of less than, say, 20 seconds, be very careful when you do physical exercise. 
don't have your mouth open because your risk is of hyperventilation. So do your physical exercise with the mouth closed, but allow your nose to determine the intensity of your physical exercise. And don't push it to the extreme that you have to be forcing the air in and out of the nose. Because if you're forcing the air in and out of the nose, you could hurt the inside of the nose. And in any event, if you just sustain nasal breathing in and out through the nose, within five to six weeks, the air hunger will diminish and your fitness levels will improve. And the other aspect of this is that when you do it, your nose is more likely to become runny at the start. So bring a tissue with you, but the nose does dry up because it becomes more comfortable or more conditioned, you know, to be able to cope with that greater volume of air. Now, if you have any sports medicine scientists, I would really, I would say that this is crying out for attention. And I can't understand how, can you imagine all of the universities who are teaching sports medicine? There are very few studies on nasal breathing during physical exercise. How did they miss that one? But one, there is one in the States um, called George Dallam. And I think he's in Colorado State University, D-A-L-L-A-M. Now, he works with pretty high-level triathletes. And he was a triathlete himself. He switched to nasal breathing about six years ago. And he's been interested in studying it on a number of papers. So you'll find one recent, well, it's 2018. He looked at 10 recreational athletes. Now, I think he spent two years trying to recruit athletes to do this study. Two years. And such was the belief in nasal breathing that that after two years of recruiting, he managed to get 10 recreational athletes. He asked them, to do all of their physical exercise by breathing in and out through the nose for a period of six months. And at the end of six months, he wanted to test them. Because there's no point in grabbing a bunch of athletes and saying, all right, lads, I want you now to breathe through your nose and I'm going to test you. They're going to fail terribly because you're adding an extra load onto them. And they're feeling an intense air hunger. And, you know, of course they're going to be held back. But he said... Train with your mouth closed for six months and then we will test you. You don't need to train for six months. Even if you train for six weeks, you're going to get improvements. But the improvements were as follows. With nose breathing in comparison with mouth breathing, the individuals were able to achieve 100% of their work rate intensity. Number two, they had 22% less ventilation with nasal breathing as with mouth breathing. 22% less ventilation. There's an economical saving there which must have implications with endurance athletes because there's an energy cost associated with breathing. Like your muscles consume quite an an amount of oxygen. Um, Normally during, as we sit here, it's probably about 2 to 3%. If you do moderate exercise, it's about 6%. If you do pretty strenuous exercise, it's about 10%. And if you do maximum physical exercise, it could be about 13% or so. So there is an economical cost associated with breathing less. Now, the fraction of expired oxygen was less with nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. And also carbon dioxide in the blood was 44 millimeters of mercury with nasal breathing and 40 with mouth breathing. So the body was able to cope with higher CO2 in the blood. So I think, you know, there's a number of tangible benefits there. And yeah, we would love to see sports medicine Start pulling it apart, you know, investigate it and uh, just see and ask the question, does it make logical sense that people should be using their nose for physical exercise? What does the nose do in comparison to the mouth? The mouth does zero. And when you're watching elite athletes, say you're watching the Olympics or watching a marathon on TV and you're watching the way that these men and women are breathing, do you typically see them breathing through their nose? Like when they get to that level, have they figured that out or have their coaches taught them or is there still room for improvement among the elite? Because most of them don't even know this. Yeah, of course. Like I'm not saying that an elite athlete, if I'm working with an elite athlete, I'm not going to, I'm not going to demand that they nasal breathe during competition. But what we will use is we will use nasal breathing during their training to cause adaptations that are beneficial 
to when they are doing competition. And if they are doing competition at an intensity of which they can sustain nasal breathing, yes, maintain nasal breathing. But if the intensity gets too much and you have to switch to mouth breathing, switch to mouth breathing. But have a decent bolt score. Because then your breathing is more efficient and economical. And you'll have a greater reserve because you're not likely to be expending energy unnecessarily. Now the other thing with an elite athlete is that we will do breath holding. Like, you know, people do, for example, I'll give you an example. The the exercise that I spoke about earlier, repeated sprints, 40 meter sprints on the exhalation with a, with a departure or a 30 second recovery between each. This was tested by Wurons with 21 highly trained rugby union players in Australia. These are professional rugby union players. Normally at this level, if you get a fraction of a percent of an improvement, it's a good game. These guys, he divided them up into two groups. 10 or 11 of them did 40 meter sprint with normal breathing, as they normally do to stimulate anaerobic glycolysis. And the other group did it with breath holding. Over a four week period, the group who did the breath holding improved their repeated sprint ability from nine reps to 14.8 before exhaustion within four weeks. From nine reps. Now you think of repeated sprint ability, that's an athlete's ability to do all-out effort followed by a very brief recovery before all-out effort followed by a very brief recovery. And it is tested in team sports. It has applications for, you think of American football, hockey, basketball, MMA, boxing, sprinting. So there's many different sports that can benefit from improving repeated sprint ability. But to get that gain, 9 reps to 14.8 within 4 weeks in highly trained rugby union. The ex- the control group who were doing their sprinting with normal breathing, they increased from 9 to 10. So it was marginal. They had some gain, but it was marginal in comparison to the breath hold group. So, you know, I think breathing has been untouched in the athletic world, with the exception of there are some athletes that are practicing it now. And... I want to look at an athlete's breathing from many different perspectives, not just in terms of the physical performance, but also teaching them how to alter states. How does an athlete warm up? How do you prepare an athlete for getting into the zone? How does an athlete alter their states if, for example, it's in a football match and they have to take a penalty shoot? How can they down-regulate just as the sniper is pulling the trigger of a gun? How do you recover post-physical exercise? How do you improve your sleep? How do you strengthen your breathing muscles so that the diaphragm is less likely to fatigue? How do you improve your tolerance to the gas carbon dioxide and reduce your breathlessness? There's a lot to it. You know, the breath is, it's much more than that common instruction that was put out there take a deep breath and you'll be fine you can really delve into this and i have to say i'm 20 years 20 years into this and the longer i'm in it the more that i just realize that i know hardly anything because it is vast and that makes it exciting i can see why yes when we take a specific example though of a athletic event we'll use the marathon where they're They're not near their maximal effort when they're running that race. And we're looking at the elites. Would you say the people who are winning those races, like we know within the last number of years, we've had somebody go below the two hour mark in the marathon. Would you say the elites are breathing through their nose? Like when you're watching that and, and, or looking at highlights, do you, do you notice that these people have picked up on this or, or is it still like some athletes have. Yeah, and we do see it. We do. It's more. It's um the minority of athletes who have adopted to nasal breathing. There is one runner, a USA sprinter, Sonia Richards Ross or Sonia Ross Richards, and she's an Olympian athlete. She's she's won several gold medals, and you will see photographs of her in full flight with her mouth closed, in sprinting, four hundred meters. So she's breathing, but she's breathing with her mouth closed. But if you look at her jaw structure and if you look at the size of her nostrils, 
and she's going to have super and absolutely superb breathing efficiency and economic and economics so the athletes who were doing really well you know we are all born differently and some athletes just as with concentration some people naturally have good concentration and others have to develop it i had to develop it with athletes if you have an athlete who is prone to perfectionist tendencies as many of them do if you have athletes who are prone to anxiety or panic disorder or any sort of tendency towards exercise induced bronchoconstriction all of these athletes will be impacted by their breathing patterns so i would even start with them now you know it, like would i request for somebody to run the entire 26 miles with their mouth closed no not necessarily but what i would do is ask them to especially when you can do it use your nose as a means of conservation and conserving energy i'll give you one example there's an orthodontist from Agora Hills in California. His name is Dr. William Hang. And he's an orthodontist who really understands about the face. And when he's looking at a child or looking at an adult, he's not just thinking about the, the teeth, but he's also thinking about how can I develop the airway here to the maximum potential. And William Hang is ran several martins many many martins decades of martins i'm not sure how old the man is he has to be in his mid 60s and he runs all of his martins with the mouth closed and the most recent boston martin i'm not sure if it's if it has it taken place or is it it's coming up soon in the next month or two um but he will run that with the mouth closed and that's the way he does it and you know we've we've many many instances of people who are ultra ultra distance runners and martin runners adapting to nasal breathing and being able to do it for the 26 miles and it just makes sense you know it is a bit tougher at the start but if you keep on doing your physical exercise and if you have to get a nasal dilator you know we use a little plastic device as i said just to open up the airway and that can make the big difference because you're still harnessing the benefits of nasal breathing but allowing better airflow as well I know I got to let you go here soon, but one final question, this has to do with a challenge that I'm facing right now and working through and that's snoring. And I mentioned before that I've tried the mouth taping. I've also tried to open up the, uh, the nose with the, the, the nose tape. I forget what they're called. Um, but I'm still snoring. So I'm curious, a, how often do you find those two factors can help eliminate snoring and or sleep apnea? And for somebody like me who's still struggling after implementing those, what's the next step? So snoring through the mouth will stop as long as you get the mouth closed. So, and I'll always say to students, say, do a snore through the mouth. And it goes like this. And now close your mouth. And close your mouth and try and snore through your mouth. Yeah, in my case, my mouth's taped, so I'm not snoring through the mouth. So nasal snoring is a is a caused by turbulence inside the nasal airway and the nasopharynx but it's a combination of breathing and the airway so what we can change is we can change flow and by changing breathing patterns you can reduce <clears throat> you can reduce resistance in the airway but we can't change the airway so if you have somebody with a compromised nasal airway you may not be able to completely eradicate nasal snoring. But what we can do is that every time that the bolt score improves, we can reduce the resistance to breathing because when breathing becomes lighter and slower, nasal snoring reduces. But it may not go away because you're talking about two things coming into play there. And like I'll say to students coming in, make the sound of a snore through your nose and it goes like this. <sighs> And now to breathe really slowly in through your nose and a very relaxed and a slow and gentle breath out through your nose and a really slow breath coming into your nose and a very relaxed and slow breath out. And as you're breathing slowly in and out through your nose, try and snore through your nose. And you'll find it more difficult to do. So you'll find that as your breathing pattern is slower during sleep, which in turn is influenced by how you breathe during the day, that when you are breathing lighter and slower during sleep, your snoring is reduced. 
but it may not go away altogether. And sleep apnea is, of course, it's a combination of airway and flow. But sleep medicine is focusing specifically on the airway. And there's no attention whatsoever on flow. Has the individual got their mouth open? That's going to increase the risk of sleep apnea. Are they breathing using the upper chest? That's going to increase the risk. Are they breathing faster and harder? That's going to increase the risk. So, you know, in terms of the, the article that I wrote, and I've written about this now in, in the other in the breathing cure as well, because I think we really need to get breathing out there. And breathing is not going to be the total cure for sleep apnea, but it can make a big difference. And once the person starts adopting and embracing those habits, it's cost effective because, you know, like once you know it, you can pick up a book for $25, $20. It's all in there. So in my case, just keep working on the techniques and um, yes, work on bringing that bolt score higher and higher and, and just see how, how it evolves. Yeah. And what you could do is also is reduce your breathing volume for 15 minutes before sleep. Now, that's one way. And there is another tool that we use, and I use it with my own students. I use a buteco belt. So we have a belt that encompasses the midriff and we have people wear it during sleep and it slows down their breathing. It doesn't cause them to breathe in the upper chest. They're breathing using the diaphragm, but it's slowing down their breath. And also bear in mind, you know, the bedroom should be airy. It shouldn't be overly hot or stuffy because that's going to cause breathing to be faster and harder. Alcohol can cause breathing to be faster and harder high stress levels, you know, so there's different factors that can change our breathing patterns. So we just have to be kind of aware of that as well. All right. Thank you for all that. And how can the listeners connect with you after the show? Yeah, it's like we have, I give Zoom classes all the time and we have different courses and books, etc. for asthma, anxiety, panic disorder, sleep apnea, children's breathing. That's on butecoclinic.com. B-U-T-E-Y-K-O clinic.com and then for sports performance that's oxygenadvantage.com and um, the exercises are in the box and the, the videos for children are free anyway on YouTube so you'll find all of the children's program is free of charge and uh, we're on social media and yeah um, you know reach out to us and we've got a good team here so we'll be more than happy to help all right, Patrick, really enjoyed this. We covered a lot and I'm sure it's going to help a lot of people. The work you're doing is just so important. So keep uh, doing what you're doing and thank you. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Jesse. Take care.